This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Seasons, greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and panto villain. Victor Herbert's 1905 operetta Babes in Toyland occupies kind of the odd middle ground of traditional holiday fare. It's not cherished and ubiquitous on the Christmas Carol or Nutcracker level, but neither is it completely forgotten like so much of the flotsam that washes upon this court's shores. It's one of those things that pops up every so often, reminds you it's a thing, and then vanishes into the ether. It doesn't help that the property is kind of amorphous. Even though it's been adapted for film multiple times, the plot, characters, and frequently the music tends to change with each permutation, and seldom for the better. Case in point, our next Defender, the 1986 made-for-television adaptation. Much of Herbert's score was jettisoned for this NBC movie of the week, replaced by songs by Leslie Berkus, who seems to have been the Christopher Lee of the composer world, taking any old job just for the joy of working. But it's really most memorable for its cast, which includes a pre-Bill and Ted Keanu Reeves, a post-ET pre-rehab Drew Barrymore, Richard Mulligan, Eileen Brennan, and Pat Morita. The two-hour and 25-minute broadcast edition was cut to a trim 90 minutes for the VHS release, but we here in Musical Hell are nothing if not thorough, as well as bound by the constraints of what we can find on the internet. So, let us examine the full, uncut Babes in Toyland. It's Christmas Eve in Ohio, and the weather is awful in addition to the general awfulness that is Ohio, and in the Piper household, things are a bit scattered. Mom is struggling to get home with little Joey, big sister Mary has a shift at work, and Dad is... I'm not sure, dead or divorced or went out for cigarettes and never came back or something. All of this means that little Lisa Piper has taken it upon herself to be the responsible one in the family. I got you a great present. Don't ask what it is. It's a surprise. I bet it's a new blender. We could really use one for the family. It's a sled. A sled? I thought for a change you might want something fun. Mary, meanwhile, has problems of her own. Sure, her job at the customer service desk of a toy store allows her to flirt with her co-worker Jack, who, being an early Keanu Reeves character, is kinda dopey, but nice. But the downside is their boss, Mr. Barney, is your standard greedy capitalist bastard who also likes to engage in a little light sexual harassment. You know, for a smart looking girl, you're really pretty dumb. Don't you know it's better business to be nice to the boss than to some pretty stock boy with his fingers in the tail? So, in case you haven't figured it out, this is one of those deals where everybody Lisa will meet in the movie's fantasy realm has a counterpart in her own life, and sin number one is that nothing really comes of it. It might have been interesting if there was some kind of conflict that paralleled the main plot, say, Mary feeling she needs to put up with her boss's horribleness because she's doing her part to help the family after Dad went wherever he went, but it mostly exists to provide knockoff Wizard of Oz vibes which is kind of appropriate, as the original Herbert operetta was written for the same market as the early stage productions of the Baum classic. Back at home, Lisa hears on the news that the blizzard is growing steadily worse right before the storm knocks the television and phone out. Drew has the worst luck with phones, I swear. Concerned for her sister, Lisa has the smart idea of going all the way to the toy store on foot, where despite Mr. Barney's insistence that everybody stay put and keep that sweet holiday consumerism going, she urges the customers to get home while they still can. Mary quits along with Jack and his best buddy George, and they even grab a sled for Lisa for her trouble. Oh, Mary, a mountain master! They're the best, and so are you! <laughs> Wasn't Lisa unimpressed with... Never mind, we've got too much to go through. Having thoroughly humiliated their ex-boss, the teens and Lisa pile into Jack's car to drive home and, oh sweet Lucifer, I feel a bad song coming on. I come from Cincinnati, the best town in Ohio, USA. At first they called it Cincy, but since Cincy is so natty. Yes, it's terrible, but just file it away for now. It will be back in worse form. 
Fortunately, the song doesn't last very long, as a tree crashes into the exterior shot, causing the stagehands to shake the car so much that Lisa flies out. <laughs> magic of bad special effects, Lisa arrives in Toyland, floating down on her sled as an ethereal chorus sings the realm's praises. The visuals don't quite measure up to the hype, having the cardboard quality and creepy mascots of an extremely low-rent theme park. Upon landing, she encounters Georgie Porgy. His career of unwanted kissing goes unremarked upon here. He serves as chief taster at the Toyland Cookie Factory and as the official exposition. My best friend Jack's sweetheart Mary is about to marry that terrible mean old yicko Barnaby, but she really loves Jack. Why is Mary marrying this terrible old Barnaby instead of his friend? Because Barnaby bought the mortgage on her mother's house and said he'd throw them all out in the street if she didn't. Everybody got that? Man, poor Jill Sholin. If it's not demon-cursed, skin-flaying immortal composers, it's skeevy panto villains. Unfortunately for the evil Barnaby, he forgot to tell the officiant to skip the whole speak now or forever hold your peace part, giving Lisa room to step in and disrupt the wedding. Jack comes in to sweep Mary off her feet, Barnaby retreats with the standard I'll get you my pretties, everyone sings Lisa's praises, and she gets pretty tight with Jack, Mary, and Georgie. So. Maybe it would be better if you went back home, back to Cincinnati. I don't want to leave Toyland yet. Okay, I don't think the writers quite have a handle on Lisa's personality or what she's doing in this movie. When a character in a story is pulled from their world and into another, whether it's a dream, reality, or some ambiguous position between the two, there's usually something they have to do or learn while they're there. In Labyrinth, for example, Sarah has a direct objective, to find and rescue her baby brother, but her experience is also a rite of passage, as she learns to look past her first judgment, face her problems rather than retreating into her dream world, and finally embrace her own strength. Babes in Toyland seems to be working on the premise that Lisa has grown up too fast and needs to rediscover the joy of childhood, but her actions don't bear that out. Most of the time, she acts like a normal kid albeit a normal kid as written by middle-aged men who probably aren't around kids all that much. She's not overly concerned with how she got here or how she's going to get back. She doesn't need to be sold on the magic and wonder of Toyland at all, and she tends to solve everyone else's problems rather than learning anything herself. Except towards the end, but that's a separate issue. So Barnaby retreats to his bowling ball fortress. I just judge them. I don't explain them to plot his revenge and also work on the long game he's got going on. See, according to Exposition Georgie, Jack Nimble is Barnaby's nephew and heir to the Toyland Cookie Trust, which, since Toyland is a cookie-based economy, is a pretty big deal. But thanks to some legal wrangling from Barnaby, Jack can only inherit the trust once he turns 21, and then only if he is married. Otherwise, Barnaby gets the trust for good. Everybody got that? Good. So the next step in Barnaby's evil plan is to go to the cookie factory, send everybody off on a cookie break, and then have his henchmen, Zack and Mac, toss their cookies. For a considerable amount of time. Get on with it. Yes, get on! I'm beginning to see how easy it was to trim this down to 90 minutes for a home video release. Even if you don't count all the post-commercial break establishing shots and lengthy transitional sequences, most of them involving characters driving around the town in little kitty cars, there's a lot that doesn't add anything to the movie. For example, there's Mary's mom, Mother Hubbard, who is also the old lady who lives in a shoe and apparently the guardian of every nursery rhyme kid ever. She starts off by pushing Mary to go through with the marriage to Barnaby, but after some prodding from Lisa, decides she'd much rather hook up with him herself. Something vaguely resembling hilarity ensues. I suppose to you, a man's best friend is his dwarf troll. Barnaby calls out the local law enforcement teddy bears and accuses Jack of grand theft cookie. All-purpose muckety-muck, Justice Grimm believes the rather specious evidence, as Jack does his early Keanu Reeves best to appear indignant at the situation. 
It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of, Justice Grimm. Why would I want to steal from myself? Jack is taken into custody, forcing Lisa, Mary, and Georgie to sing up a plan for his rescue. Babes in the wood, though that we may be, this little baby is gonna find a way. Oh, sweet Lucifer, I know Drew Barrymore got into some surprisingly adult shit at a young age, but couldn't you have found an actual child for her singing double? Or at least someone who could do a decent imitation of one? The end result is that they decide to break Jack out of prison, which they do by having Georgie filch the keys while Lisa distracts Justice Grimm with tales of the magical place known as Cincinnati. And Jack and Mary have a love song. It's the notion of smoothing on a lotion, full of soothing potions. And that's about all I want to know about Jack and Mary's love life. Thank you very much. Unaware that Barnaby is watching, thanks to a creature called Trollog who has a surveillance cam eye, the heroes decide they need to seek the assistance of the Toy Master, who is in charge of Santa's toy making operation and also the ultimate authority around Toyland. So they head to his workshop, which is about as enchanting as it can be on a budget, and the Toy Master proves to be pretty up to date on the current situation, even knowing something of Lisa's origins. You Cincinnati? I know about that. <laughs> you must be quite proud of Pete Rose. Awkward. Again, Lisa is pretty dazzled by the Toy Master's digs for someone who isn't supposed to be into toys all that much, even admiring the Chekhov's life-size toy soldiers he has gathering cobwebs in storage. But eventually they get down to business, and the Toy Master proposes a means of neutralizing Barnaby. It seems he's been siphoning some evil out of the world and storing it in a large bottle for... I'm not entirely sure why. It's certainly not making things noticeably better on Earth. But he does have enough room in the bottle for Barnaby's badness. Barnaby, watching this whole reveal on Trollog Cam, decides he'd rather steal the evil for his own purposes. Georgie, where'd you get that cookie? Uh, I found it on the floor of the cookie factory. Clearly, Georgie has never heard about preserving evidence. Or the five-second rule. Realizing they might discover something about the missing cookies if they head back to the factory, they putt-putt over there and make the cardinal mistake of splitting the party. This plays right into Barnaby's hands as he drops Jack down a trap door and subjects him to his villain song. So little love and so much hatred to Give Richard Mulligan credit, he knows exactly what kind of movie and role he's in and makes the most of it. Another unnecessarily roundabout sequence ensues where Barnaby forces Jack to write a breakup letter to Mary, causing her to believe he left Toyland and spend several minutes searching all over town for him to no avail, until everyone thinks to look in the obvious stronghold of the obviously evil villain at which point Mary gets captured, which means that whole thing was pointless, causing Georgie and Lisa to fret a bit before going to the Toy Master's shop to ask his advice And sin number five. There's maybe three locations in this movie, and the script keeps bouncing around between them like the world's dullest pinball. Lisa is having a slight theological crisis, as she wonders why the benevolent Toy Master can't do anything about Barnaby running around being obviously evil. The Toy Master is giving her the usual spiel about good and evil being in everybody, which doesn't make sense for a town working along Victorian melodrama lines, when Barnaby and his goons bust in and subdue the good guys in a laughably easy manner. Ah. It's fine. It's all mine. Really, Barnaby, I know you're bound by card-carrying villain protocol, but have a little pride at least. Speaking of protocol, Barnaby explains his evil plan to use the bottled evil to take over Toyland and remake it in his own image, before gloating his way out and leaving the Trollog to stand guard, who proves to be an even worse jailer than Justice Grimm, and that's saying something. Stay away from me! sure if it's the costumes or the filming or the fact that the Toy Master subdues the Trollog by simply painting over its eye, but the result is this silly little fight scene earns sin number six. 
Anyway, the Toy Master commissions Lisa and Georgie to get the Flasco Evil back. To do that, they must enter the oh-so-spooky forest of the night that surrounds Toyland. This is a pretty big deal, and apparently someone realized Lisa should pretend to be conflicted about something, so she, or rather her obviously adult singing double, pauses to sort things out in a ballad. I live in two worlds, one made of dreams, which one seems more real. It doesn't really have a whole lot to offer in the way of character or motivations, but it does get Lisa to insist on not being left behind where it's safe. So Georgie and Lisa get past the gate guard by, well, just walking past him really, I mean he's a teddy bear, what's he going to do about it, and enter the forest of Day for Night Filter. <laughs> tell if the dim visuals are poor filmmaking or just the poor quality of the recording, so let's just skip to Georgie and Lisa falling through a trap door. Wow, Barnaby has those things everywhere! And landing in the same cell with Jack and Mary. Now with a complete set of good guys, Barnaby announces his plan to use the concentrated evil to invigorate his army of trolls. By the way, he has an army of trolls. And send them rampaging through Toyland. But first, he doses the good guys with a little evil smoke in order to bend them to his will. But it doesn't work for Lisa, because she is pure of heart and has a child's innocence and... <laughs> I'm kidding. You won't believe what saves her. I guess I'm immune because I'm from... Cincinnati! Yes, Cincinnati! Come on! Toy Master Shadow's good and evil all of us hold on to the good inside of you! They named it Cincinnati, so they say! No, sorry, I refuse to believe Cincinnati holds the key to conquering the power of pure evil. To begin with, have you actually been there? At Lisa's direction, everyone does some quick zombie improv to fake Barnaby out long enough to escape, and after a lame reenactment of the endless stair scene, they emerge back at the cookie factory, where a couple of props are enough to stymie the superpowered evil army nipping at their heels. So they head back, where else, to the Toy Master's shop, but this time Barnaby and his goons are close behind. I'll smack the smiles off their face! I'll kick the deals out of their heart! No more! No more being subtle! What can I say? The man understands the assignment. What follows is one of the most beautifully, hilariously awful two minutes ever committed to film, as we see the Toyland equivalent of a car chase. That's a little one! I want her! I want the little one! Hey, hey, drive in a counterclockwise direction and no head on bumping! This ends with Barnaby and the goons crashing into one another, so while they exchange insurance information and probably make notes to have long, sad talks with their agents, the good guys motor over to the Toy Masters and implore him to do, well, anything. I have only toys here. Toys cannot protect us from anything. As long as there is one person within these walls who can't believe in them. Who doesn't believe in toys? It must be you, Lisa. Look, I get what they're really trying to say, which is that Lisa needs to believe in imagination and play and the joy of childhood, but this is a very clumsy way of putting it. To begin with, it's never really felt like Lisa doesn't believe in Toyland. In fact, she spent most of the movie trying to sort its shit out. Second, I can see imploring her to believe in something abstract that would require a bit of faith, but toys? That's like believing in socks or coyly the spring sprite. They exist regardless of your opinion of them. I will say, though, that Barrymore really sells the moment where Lisa regrets having to grow up too fast and longs for the innocent joys of youth although she is helped along by a healthy dose of reality subtext. I always wanted to be a kid. I always wanted to play with toys. As the trolls shamble into the Toyland Square, Lisa declares her belief in the giant toy soldiers, bringing them to life to Herbert's classic march. It looks like someone put the wall and Squid Game into the Nightmare Blender and hit mix. 
The creepy cavalry arrives none too soon, as the trolls are rampaging through the town and the world's cutest barricade is doing nothing to stop them. But with a barrage of cannon fire and assorted fruit, the invading forces are driven back. Eventually. <laughs> banished to the forest of the night, and since the trolls are going all hyenas at the end of the Lion King, that doesn't bode well for him. Jack gets the cookie trust, Lisa is declared a hero and gets to be maid of honor at Mary's wedding, but she finally realizes she's homesick and is ready to go home after a bit more lecturing from the Toy Master. One day, when you're all grown up, you must remember to keep the child in you alive. After bidding farewell to the mascots and culturally insensitive dolls in the traditional I'm going to miss you most of all scarecrow scene, she's ready to go home. And guess who's giving her a lift? But I haven't said goodbye to the Toy Master! Well, well, well. You should have a nice trip, Lisa, if you don't mind a few bumps. Toy Master! I'm not sure if this reveal makes the Toy Master's inaction throughout the movie better or worse. On one hand, he is kind of swamped during the holidays, but on the other hand, he's Santa fucking Claus! Somewhere around the Milky Way, Lisa wakes up back in her own home, immediately going into and you are there and you mode. He taught me that it was in our hearts that we must stay young and try to be good. And above all, we must believe. Yes, we get it. Stay young at heart. There's no place like home. Watch out where the huskies go and don't you eat that yellow snow. Fade to black already. For something that's supposed to be about rediscovering joy and fun, Babes in Toyland is the equivalent of getting clothes from your least favorite relative. Boring and devoid of taste or style. The cast is talented and they try their best, but they don't have anything to work with. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For the dull, unsatisfying script, writers Glenn McDonough and Paul Zindel are condemned to get nothing but their least favorite chocolates in the box. For some terrible dubbing, the sound editing team is condemned to a holiday mix with nothing but various versions of Last Christmas. Finally, for singing the praises of a very unpraiseworthy city, Leslie Burkus is condemned to an extended stay in Cincinnati. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>